brace yourself because you're about to dive into another free first hour episode of the Higher Side Chats. And we just want to let you know that whether you're looking for a companion through your paranoid insomnia, entertaining yourself through one of life's mundane activities, or trying to ward off the internal screams of all those sad, smothered souls around the office, THC is here. And you should know that every episode of the Higher Side Chats has an entire second hour for Plus members. Sign up at thehiresidechatsplus.com and you'll get years of Plus show archives, lifetime forum access, a special invite to Greg Carlwood's monthly joint sessions, MP3s of THC music, bonus episodes, tour videos, and 10% off t-shirts, grinders, and whatever else ends up in the Higher Side store. It's $8 a month that you won't miss, so become a Plus member and treat yourself in these troubled times. Always action-packed and commercial-free, which means you'll unfortunately never hear my voice again. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chat. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. It's the end of the world as we know it, Higher Side Chatters, and I feel fine. From sunny San Diego, I'm Greg Carlwood. And I'm still surprised by how little attention we give to the experience of life and how weird it is that we're even here. Many of us are exhausted by demanding jobs, frustrated with rush hour traffic, or addicted to being entertained, and the deeper questions about this overall experience oftentimes just go untouched. Well, when the mainstream academic and scientific communities ignore clues like out-of-body experience, near-death experience, remote viewing, telepathy, and other psi research, it's hard to get much further down the road to understanding consciousness or what we even are. Maybe they want it this way. The quarantine around entheogens and the lack of any sort of deep spirituality might suggest so. And sure, you're free to meditate as much as you want if you can somehow offload the stress imposed by our society within the system and the shallow razzle-dazzle of digital screens. Our culture does not make it easy, and many of us probably struggle to cite even just a few examples of our friends and family that we think have evolved beyond the basics, and that's saying something. But here to say a lot more, blow open the doors of perception, and get those rusty mental wheels turning is returning guest Jim Elvidge. Jim was kind enough to join me all the way back in 2013 for THC's 80th show, and again for our 100th episode special to talk about the very interesting research on reality that he did in his book, The Universe Solved. And now we sit down to talk about his latest book, a follow-up of sorts, called Digital Consciousness, A Transformative Vision. In it, he lays out all the details for the things he's decoded under reality's hood and seeks to answer all the big questions. Why are we here? What's the deal with death, dreaming, and drug trips? What's behind paranormal experiences, and how do we explain the Mandela effect? If you don't recall, Jim is an electrical engineer by trade, with years of research into consciousness, quantum mechanics, Eastern philosophy, information theory, and artificial intelligence, which puts him in prime position to be the guy who knows the things. So let's unpack Pandora's box, the universe solver and decoder of digital consciousness. Jim, my man, welcome back to the higher side. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Greg. Uh, really nice intro, and you know I'm kind of humbled by that. I am certainly not an expert in any of those areas, but I do like connecting the dots. And you know, I, I think sometimes people focus on a very narrow area and then they miss the bigger picture. And, and maybe that's a little bit of what I bring to the table in terms of some of these books and some of these ideas. And awesome to be on your show again. You know, always <laughs> love being here. Uh, thank you, man. I'm psyched to be doing this too. Hard to believe it's been six years. I definitely think about that last show. I still get the occasional email asking when you might be back, and I really enjoyed this latest book. Honestly, I was glad to see you wrote it, but I saw digital consciousness and thought, ah, okay, I get it. Simulation theory, holographic universe, the VR analogy of life, and it took me a little while to really crack it open, but I'm glad I did because you cover so much more than that, and it's going on my shelf next to Dr. Dean Radin's Magic is Real, because you include study after study of all these strange aspects and features of consciousness. You include the Russell Targ SRI research, 
plenty of studies on near-death experience and out-of-body experience, insights from mystic yogis talking about aspects of the other side, and I've always thought that these stranger qualities of life are where the clues really are. You learn the parameters of something by reflecting on the anomalous things on the edges, not the mundane qualities in the middle, and if a person's theory of everything just dismisses those aspects, then it doesn't work. And I'm, I'm sure you'd agree with that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think all of the interesting things are, are on the edges. In your intro, you talked about how we don't have time to meditate. You know, our culture doesn't make it easy. And it's so true. We're in this cycle of, you know, work and entertainment and sleep, and there's not much time for anything else. Myself, I used to meditate and I got pretty good at it. I got to the point where I could have some out-of-body experiences. I could just close my eyes, start meditating, and feel myself slip into a different space. And I lost it. I lost it over the last few years just because of, you know, being busy. And I, I really want to get back you know, to that because that is where the interesting stuff is. That's where the clues are. And, you know, it's so easy to kind of stay in the mainstream, believe what you see and hear and read. <laughs> but then when you get on the edge, like you said, there's stuff that just doesn't fit, and it's that stuff that I think is the clues to what it's all about. Indeed, and it seems that you've gone deeper than most, even if you lost it. I mean, even a sliver is further than a lot of us get. And I know you've dealt with the maybe unintended ideas that digital consciousness invokes. It sounds kind of cold and mechanical, and I almost thought you were going to be writing about the transhumanistic goal of transferring consciousness to a hard drive, and thankfully, it's not that at all. But I'm sure I'm not the first one to think that. And let's correct that notion. And maybe you can flesh out some of the groundwork we need to understand this overall perspective and why you still find digital to be the best term, despite it being a bit problematic. Yeah, good points. I, I mean, when coming up with the name for the book, the first book, Universe Solved, I mean, it's kind of hard to beat that name, right? <laughs> yes. And, and I didn't want to just be Universe Solved 2 or Return of Universe Solved or something like that. You know, and the two key areas of the research that I've done and the, the ideas that lead to some of these conclusions are the nature of reality, you know, our apparent reality, is it digital or is it continuous or analog? And then the nature of consciousness. And so those two things together, and, and I do believe probably deep down our apparent reality at least is digital, and I believe that the underlying reality probably is as well. But every word that we use comes with so much baggage and so much connotation. You say the word God and people immediately visualize, you know, a, a guy in the clouds with a big white beard. You say the word digital and people immediately think of laptops and iPhones and cold calculating computational systems. But it doesn't have to be that way. You know, movies, pictures of flowers, you know, art that's been reproduced can evoke beautiful emotions in people, even though they've been digitized. And we're talking about layers beneath our apparent awareness that's so far down. You know, in other words, we're dealing with atoms and things like that and subatomic particles. And then, oh, I don't know, maybe strings or whatever it is getting even further down than that. It appears to me that the you know fundamental construct of reality is information, and information is digital. So, but it doesn't change anything in terms of how warm our reality seems to be. It's just the way that it's presented to us. And then, yeah, consciousness again. You know, so much has been done talked about in terms of consciousness emanating from the brain, and I don't believe that. You know, for that reason, I, I think there's there's more to reality. I think we live in a virtual reality, most likely. And there's much more to it than the apparent, you know, reductionist view of the materialist. And I think that the transhuman movement, with some exceptions, I mean, I think there's some people who are allowing for the, the virtual experience as well. But a lot of the transhumanists are actually materialists, and they think that the only way to attain immortality is to upload your consciousness to something that lives longer than organic humans do. And I don't think that's true at all. I think we're already immortal because I believe we reincarnate. So the whole premise behind age plus and life extension and transhumanism is questionable to me. Mm, mm, yes. And 
you can simply just look at all digital media, movies, television, video games. We see a final product, but we know that it comes from somewhere else. And what it really is, is just a signal. It's data. It's true nature is not what we're looking at. And that's kind of the point, right? Yeah, absolutely. Even the way the brain works, you know, the brain is just signals and those signals are, you know, instance of firings that are effectively binary in a way. Did this neuron fire or did this synapse fire? Did it not fire? You know, and what's the network of patterns that go on there? So the way we experience everything you know, it does have a lot of digital nature to it. So the, if the word digital bothers people, call it something else. Call it information-based or call it, you know, non-continuous or something mm-hmm. like that. So I wouldn't be afraid of the term digital consciousness in terms of, like, uploading consciousness or something like that. It's really just combining two concepts that our consciousness is separate from the brain and that deep down reality is probably information-based. And, and the results of that those two ideas actually turn out to be pretty astounding. (laughs) Indeed. And you kind of just touched on a few of them, but in the book you have four tenets or principles of digital consciousness in this overall theory. Can you tell us about those? How do they break down? Sure. So the first one is that consciousness is fundamental and primary. Again, like we talked about before, the use of words, when people say consciousness, they think, oh, it's when I'm awake you know, I'm unconscious when I'm asleep. I'm talking about something different, and it's not even self-awareness. It's the deeper sea of existence that we have. So consciousness is sort of fundamental to that. And it's not just an artifact of the complexity of the brain. Nobody can figure out how to make something so complex that it suddenly becomes self-aware and conscious. I don't believe that it can be done. I think it's possible that we may at some point say, okay, this silicon-based construct here is complex enough to to serve as a vehicle for my consciousness. And if I have a way to, you know, occupy that, that's cool. But it's still, you know, the free will of my consciousness to make that decision. It's not that it will come automatically out of the complexity of that system. So I think it's fundamental to the universe. And you know, again, the universe is another word. We think of the universe as what we see when we look out in the sky. But I'm, when I say universe, I mean all that there is. I mean the deeper underlying reality plus this probably virtual reality that we live in. So it's fundamental to that. It's fundamental to the deeper reality. And it's more like the source of our experience of reality or the source of reality itself. So that's the first thing. The consciousness is fundamental and primary. The second tenant is that matters information and that forces or rules about how this information interacts with each other. And we can, I'm sure we'll dive deep into that as well. The third item is the idea that the reality that we experience is somewhat illusory. And you can use the word simulation, another word that comes along with a lot of baggage, but it's the most common word that's used. But, you know, illusory means that there's something else deeper than that, that it's not the real reality that we think it is. Other people will use the word virtual because it's separated from the deeper reality. So, and there's a purpose to that. It's the the reality that we experience, this apparent physical reality, it's designed for us to learn and evolve our consciousness. And when I say designed, I don't mean necessarily by, you know, an ET physicist or by a god or whatever. It could have evolved to be designed like self evolution. That is something that, you know, it's still hard to determine. Mm-hmm. The fourth tenet is that the system itself is digital. The deeper system consists of, at a minimum, all of the individuated consciousnesses, you know, yours, mine, everybody we see, animals, gnats, whatever, plus this apparent physical reality that I call a learning lab, which is kind of a construct within that deeper system, and that it's driven by a fundamental rule of continuous improvement. So it's constantly trying to get better, to elevate itself. And 
you know, we can go into more detail on this point too, but I think the way that it makes sense to elevate itself is to say, I'm going to separate myself into these individuated consciousnesses and have them elevate themselves. You know, it's a lot easier to do that than to force the entire system to be elevated in some way. So that's why we are actually all connected. You know, what the ancient mystics said, we're all connected. That's why we're, quote, part of God, if you want to use that word. And yet we are individuated in that we can act independently of each other. So it ties that whole idea together. So those are the four basic ideas. Mm. I love it, man. And you refer to reality as the learning lab, this system we're in. And we've heard that Earth is a school before, but you refer to this as all matter, galaxies, everything physical. And we should think of it as a virtual reality software program running on the all that is system. I know computer analogies for reality can get a bit tired, but when you have a virtual reality room, it has physics coded in and it has a hardness to objects you encounter. It's not real, but you can't run your character through a wall or anything. There are still rules, but what it is is ultimately code or information, as you've been saying, which is how we should look at the material world, right? It's basically just data at its core and most things are empty. Yeah, exactly. And I think analogies are important it can be you know not perfect to use an analogy for something somebody will say oh well that you know doesn't necessarily translate to what we're experiencing or whatever but it's really a good tool it's a good learning tool it's a good tool to kind of appreciate concepts so the analogy of the virtual reality that is created by some programmer is a good one it's a good analogy for the reality that we, we live in you know, one example is, as you say, if you're in a like a virtual space that's been programmed by, you know, some individual who, who has created this fantasy world, you know, something like, you know, one of these massively multiplayer online role playing games, you're in that space and it has a bunch of rules in terms of how things work. If I pick up an object in that space and throw it, it's going to follow a particular trajectory. and Usually those rules are consistent. So everybody experiences the same kind of rules. Now imagine if we were all in that space experiencing these rules and we said, and, and we had no idea that we were in a virtual reality. Like let's say our, our minds were set aside for a moment and our memories were archived or something like that. And we found ourselves in this virtual space and that's all we, we knew. We would, start exploring that. And we would say, well, you know, it's kind of odd that this thing falls to the ground the same speed as something else that I drop, even though they're different weights. Or, you know what I mean? We would start investigating and we would come up with science and we would come up with equations for things. And those equations would map to the actual equations that are encoded in the software. So I think that's exactly what we've done. We have equations that are encoded into the way our reality works, and we're discovering those. Now, as we're getting deeper and deeper, we're starting to hit the edges of the things that are giving us an indication that there's more to it than a materialistic world. And that's where things have gotten really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. And this is good context for how you explain paranormal encounters and the strange things people seem to see every so often. Aliens, Bigfoot, mantids, mothmen, these sorts of things. The mainstream model just says, no, it's impossible. But how do they fold into your overall ideas? Sure. And let me just go back a couple hundred years here. There was a time in the 1800s when people were experiencing something that was outside of the accepted view of reality. And what that was, was, you know, rocks falling from the sky meteorites. So when particles or, you know, large rocks or something from interstellar space come into our atmosphere, if they're small enough, they just burn up. And then it's just this streak across the sky that we call a meteor. But if they're big enough, they get hot. They'll show like a, you know, a, a trail and a tail, but they won't burn up entirely. And then they'll land in the ground like the one that, that landed in Russia in the early 1900s. 
You know, some of them are small, some of them are huge, size of a bus, some of them might be just, you know, little pebbles or whatever. But people are seeing these things, and the scientists in the 1800s were saying, no, impossible. You know, rocks can't fall out of the sky. This doesn't happen. You people are crackpots, and this is paranormal. You know, there's no explanation for it. Well, the only reason there wasn't, they were calling it paranormal is because at that time they didn't have an explanation for it. Now they do, and so now it's normal. So I think that, you know, we're in a state where the, we have things that we categorize as normal and things that we categorize as paranormal. Anything that we call paranormal is something that is not easily repeatable, like these rocks falling from the sky. You couldn't conjure that up. You couldn't say, well, let's go out tonight and, and record a rock falling from the sky and pick it up, and it wouldn't happen. You know, it, it just happens very infrequently. So so I think some of the paranormal things that occur in our reality now are occurring according to rules of the way our reality is formed, but they're not in the subset of rules or equations that constitutes known science. And that's okay. For example, if you're standing at a street corner and a car goes by and you both look at that car and say that is a blue Toyota Corolla, that consensus that people have in how our reality works is part of what makes it feel hard and certain. You know, the fact that everybody sees the same thing pretty much. Mm -hmm. Now, there have been some studies that show that people see different things and even at the you know atomic level, two different observers can observe completely different realities in a very scientific, rigorous scientific setting, which tells you that there is no real, true, physical underlying reality. That's a different topic we'll probably get into later. But my point is, this lack of consensus can be you know the source of some of the paranormal confusion. Well, I experienced a ghost, and somebody said, well, I was there, and I didn't experience it, and so therefore... The person who experienced it, we say, is crazy. But it doesn't mean, you know, all that is is an experience. Everything that we experience is just that. It's just a subjective experience that's processed by our consciousness. So when people experience an abduction or a, you know, something odd that they're seeing, you know, you can't really discount that. Now, you could discount it, sure. If one person in the world has claimed abduction and nobody else has, I would question that. <laughs> but when tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands have a kind of common experience, I'd say there's something going on there. It's just not something that can be explained with our set of scientific rules and equations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like the explanation. I mean, just to use the video game analogy again, if you make a program or a coded reality and it has its rules of physics, you could still have other scripts running in that environment that have different rules. If you play a video game and you get to level 10, maybe everything is felt mundane up to that point, and then suddenly there's a flaming sword floating in the sky. It's still in the game. It just defies the physics up to the point in which you've gotten. So to me, it just makes a lot of sense. It's really not that hard to conceive of that there's some rarer programs in the environment. It's kind of like the Matrix and the Merovingian being in charge of all the wolfmen and vampires. They're kind of programs that have been decommissioned in a sense or something to that effect. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's that's a really good way to put it. You know, another way could be to say that as an analogy, again, I'm not saying this is the way it actually works, but as an analogy, if you're a character in a game and you have greater than 50 spiritual points, then now you're open to seeing certain things that people who have less than 50 spiritual points can see. Mm -hmm. Or it could be more like everybody can see these things that fall outside of the normal set of rules, but they fall on kind of a bell curve of probabilities. And some people tend to see them more than other people. That probability can be easily be programmed by the system into each character's experience. It's not hard to do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, and as you've said, you're trying to add clarity and completeness to the overall digital consciousness case in the book. But a lot of these ideas have been known. I mentioned your study of Eastern philosophy in the intro. How big a factor has that been? How much inspiration did you get from Eastern philosophy or even 
ancient, long-gone civilizations that seem to have a better understanding than our big brain mainstream thinkers have today? Actually, a lot. And honestly, I've been influenced quite a bit by my girlfriend, who is, you know, she was brought up in or born in India. She was kind of steeped in Eastern philosophy, understands a lot better. And, you know, she, she reads my book and says, you know, in the Western world, people are going to be kind of like arguing about this. But in the Eastern world, it all makes sense. It's basically what we've been talking about for millennia. So, you know, I think the idea behind this is that it's a mistake to discount the learnings of ancient cultures because they weren't following a rigorous scientific method. And those learnings have some commonalities. Here again, I'm thinking kind of a little bit in terms of statistics. If I look at, say, you know, 20 different cultures and they all have a completely different way of looking at reality, then I'm going to tend to believe that, you know, none of them are right. But if I look at 20 different cultures that came from different parts of the world, different time frames, and then most likely didn't have a whole lot of influence on each other, and they came up with some very common ideas, I'm going to take those ideas a little more seriously, or maybe a lot more seriously. And especially when you realize that the reason some of these ideas came about had to do with spiritual or mystical experiences that people had. And I've done enough research on this that I feel that these are real things. It's not like some strange storm in your brain that makes you feel like you're having such and such an experience. It's more real than that. And it's real because sometimes they you know, corroborate real things, like an out-of-body experience, for example. You can corroborate that with the actual objects that exist when you, you know, see them out of body. So these mystical experiences that people have, they're kind of the source of where a lot of religions come from. You know, now man takes the religions and throws a bunch of dogma on top of it and tries to control people via that religion. But the spirit of the religion, the pure spirit of the religion, when you get back to that, they're all really, really similar. They talk about reincarnation. They talk about interconnectedness, you know, being part of him or God or whoever. Talking about Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, they talk about virtual realities, Maya. It's an ancient Sanskrit word that means illusion. It was a central theme in both Hinduism and Sikhism. And according to ancient texts, the human experience is like an interplay between eternal consciousness and Maya, the temporary illusory world. Well, that's our incarnation. So if the temporary illusory world is just the, the incarnation that we have, but there's really an eternal consciousness to us, that sounds very similar to the idea that our apparent physical reality is illusory. And again, physicists are coming up with this conclusion as well. So all of these things, they, they fit really, really well. You know, the idea of consciousness in Hinduism the word Brahman is, is considered to be the ultimate reality of the universe. And its meaning is described as something that sort of translates to bliss consciousness being. And, you know, so, so again, they came up with the same ideas. That what I'm coming to the conclusion of here isn't necessarily all that new. It's just new in the context of the Western world. And fortunately, it's been supported by a lot of the research that's going on in the Western world as well. Mm, for sure. Yeah, great points. A phrase that came up recently on the show was decolonize your thinking, because sometimes within the Western bubble, we forget that other cultures around the world might be further down the path of understanding than we are, or at least on equal footing with us. And... You write that there are a few possibilities as to how it all began, but you lean towards the idea that our reality was not necessarily created by some particular conscious entity, but rather has been evolving according to some sort of fundamental evolutionary law from the very beginning. And then later in the book, you mention, as soon as one door closes, another one opens. It's almost as if the universe wants to be understood. And I find that pretty provocative. Maybe you could talk to us about how 
these two aspects relate or what's driving this thing and is synchronicity some sort of breadcrumb lane sub program that tries to unfold the story for us if we play along yeah i i think it is and and i, I can't certainly can't take credit for um the concept of the fundamental or continuous improvement i give tom campbell a lot of credit for that one you know it's possible that somebody out there created the reality that we're talking about and we're in this virtual space and maybe we do reincarnate as it appears that we do but that it doesn't evolve in any way however that just strikes me as being kind of pointless especially again when you look at the eastern mystics who gave a purpose to and talked about a purpose as did uh, jesus and, and other sources of religions you know a purpose to our existence to to love to serve to to evolve in that way Tom Campbell talks about it as, you know, improving the quality of consciousness. And the, you know, the Eastern religions talk about the idea of karma and how what you've learned in this incarnation will affect what you do next time. So next time around, maybe, you know, you need to learn to be more patient or you need to learn humility or whatever that thing is. Well, why would you be learning these things if it wasn't to improve your consciousness in some way? So there seems to be this underlying driving need to continuously improve. And it all kind of fits together if you think of a system that starts at a very kind of low state and then creates over time, evolves over time to be complex enough to be subdivided into individual consciousnesses. And then beyond that, like, you know, use an uh, analogy of the matrix where the architect created different, different matrices and, you know, finding the one that fits right. So the reality that we're in now is something that is working pretty well for us. It's a good place for us to interact with others, learn these things that we need to learn. We can't necessarily do them in the kind of ethereal consciousness space because we know what what is there. We'd be like, you know, oh, why do I need to do anything different? But when you're grounded in something that seems physical and seems, let's say, uh, permanent in a way, you know, like our physical reality, it seems like we have an end point. We're going to die. And so we have some, you know, there's a, a little bit of an urgency to take our experiences seriously. That provides a good framework for us to learn. And so that's, you know, I think that's, that's good evidence for the idea that the underlying construct is continually improving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good explanation. And it definitely jives with the couple of weird experiences I've had with things that seem to be maybe on the other side where they have alluded to the value of life is that you get to experience what chocolate tastes like or what love is like. But it does sort of seem like all this just to teach us to love each other and be nice to each other. I mean, is this the most effective way? It seems pretty big, epic, and over the top to get that message through. <laughs> uh, yeah, it does. And I use an analogy in the book of a heat lamp. Another analogy could be if you want to run for president or run for office or something like that, how do you get people behind you? So we'll use that one. Let's say, you know, I, I'm a nobody and I want to run for office in a country that has 300 million people in it. How am I going to do that? I'm going to go knock on doors. It'll take thousands and thousands of years for me to knock on every door and convince every single person that they should vote for me or at least 50 percent of the people. Obviously impractical. Instead, what I do is I create a network. I create a network of people who believe in me who go knock on doors. Or maybe it's several levels of that network, a hierarchy of sorts, which starts looking like a political organization, which is exactly why we, we do it that way. You know, that's the analogy. In order for something big to happen, you have to break things up and give those things the self-organization and the empowerment to go forward and, and evolve in their own way. And I think that's what, if you want to use the word God or all that there is, the system, that's what it did. It broke itself up into little pieces and said, okay, each one of you pieces is going to evolve in some way. Is it going to happen fast? 
I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't learn. I know I don't learn less all that fast sometimes. Sometimes it takes, you know, I have to be hit over the head 10 times before I get something. I have to read a book 10 times before I get the concept. You know, I think change is naturally difficult for us, for our consciousness. And so it is going to take some time for us to kind of evolve. And is there an end to it? I'm not sure. You know, that's, that's getting pretty far out there, but we're certainly not at an end point now. And there's certainly plenty of room for people to evolve in terms of how they view each other and, you know, how they view their place in the world. Well, cheers to that. And absolutely, we hear the lesson. We intellectualize the lesson of love and unity and being kind to each other. But do we really live it? I don't know. Right. And uh, that was going to be my next question, though, is how do you conceptualize our graduation? What happens when we do get the message and spend a lifetime actually living it? Well, I'm not sure that that means we've learned everything we need to learn. So, you know, maybe we've really you know, devoted our lives to service of other people or animals or something like that. And maybe we've got that and that's really good, but we're still not very humble people or we're still, you know, not, not seeing something else. Our next incarnation may evolve us even further. You know, this, a lot of this is a little bit speculative. I mean, or <laughs> you could say a lot speculative. Certainly it, matches again what the eastern mystic says and it also matches the near-death experiences that people around the world have and sometimes out-of-body experiences you know it matches the message that they receive so again because of the statistical commonality of this i i feel like there's something significant there that there is this evolution of consciousness that's going on it just it makes more sense to me now as far as an end point though you asked about that. You know, some some religions believe that you achieve some state of nirvana and your goal is to get out of this constant cycle of suffering, as the Buddhists would say. You know, other experiences that people have had who have done more, you know, astral traveling or whatever. And I take some of these somewhat seriously, especially when they're pretty credible or their data is backed up by common experiences with other people or, again, corroborating evidence. You know, what some of those folks have said is that there are different roles. Some consciousnesses may have a role where they incarnate. They constantly evolve. Others may have a role where they help people, you know, find a path when they're outside of the cycle of suffering. So other people may never or other consciousnesses may never incarnate at all. So I think the the scope of that is definitely pretty speculative, but it's kind of interesting to consider that we might not all be going through the exact same path of you know, continual reincarnation and ultimately achieving nirvana. It could be something different. Right. Yeah. These are the things that are the toughest to know, pretty much impossible from our vantage point inside the system, but maybe our incubator isn't the only one. You know, we might just move on to Learning Lab 2.0 for advanced students. <laughs> that, that could be too. <laughs> when we have some evidence for that, I'll write another book. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. And I wanted to get deeper into some of the stuff in your evidence for consciousness chapter because it's so rapid fire and full of the sort of things we love around here, the anomalous stuff that's clearly explainable in your digital consciousness model. What might be a personal favorite of yours when it comes to these things on the edges and what they can tell us? Uh, you know, on the consciousness side, I think my personal favorite really has to do with quantum mechanics. The studies that are going on these days, and a lot of them are involved with a, an experiment called the double slit experiment, they're just mind-blowing. And some of the results indicate things like reverse causality. In other words, something happens after or before the, the stimulus that should cause it to happen. And these have been published, peer-reviewed, analyzed. You know, a guy named Anton Zeilinger in, in Austria uh, is, is very much on the cutting edge of this kind of research. I mean, he made the statement that, you know, objective reality simply doesn't exist and that they've determined that to... 80 orders of magnitude of certainty, which is way beyond 
what most science considers certain. I think they might consider, you know, five nines, you know, or 99.999% sure that that other 0.001% could be due to chance or some experimental, you know, error or something like that. We'll still consider it certainty, you know, pretty much fact. But the results of these quantum experiments that show that there are different realities, that objective reality doesn't exist, that you know, that locality doesn't exist. These kind of things tell us that we're in a virtual world. So that's that's actually my favorite one. And then on the on the completely opposite side of the spectrum, you've got, you know, past life experiences, psychic phenomena, out of body experiences, things like that, that and near death experiences that there have been a lot of studies on and a lot of those studies also line up a lot of common aspects of those experiences that, that indicate that we're in a virtual world. Mm, yes, there's some really funky stuff going on in quantum mechanics. And the idea of retro causality is so interesting to me. I think about that all the time in my own life and where I am now. It's like, did I backcast some of those ideals and experiences to get me here? It just all works out in such a nice story, nice, succinct little story you'd see in, from Hollywood, and it's archetypal in a sense. And so I do wonder sometimes if maybe even when I'm 50 years old, I'll have even more insight to the prospect of possibly things in two decades in the future had an effect today. It's just, it's very strange. But when you think about life in that way, it does sort of uh, in, inspire you to, to think deeper about it, I think. Yeah, definitely. So you know, there are two aspects to this retro causality idea. One is at the quantum level, and they've shown that that really does exist. You know, that you can kind of reverse the result of an experiment after the fact. That's been shown over and over again. And then people will say, okay, well, we're in a macroscopic world. We're not in a quantum world. But that's not really true because even macroscopic objects, you know, they've shown that atoms and molecules and things that are getting more and more macroscopic start following the same quantum anomalies that the subatomic particles did. And the only reason we can't see it is because the measurement equipment is you know, not sophisticated enough for us to see a perturbation in a macroscopic level. But then if you, you know, kind of step up a level and say, okay, what about our subjective experience? Could there be something like retrocausality in our subjective experience. Well, I don't know. I mean, I read all the time about people and I've known people who have had hunches, hunches that were so powerful to them that they've never had it before in their lives. You know, I should slow down before I go into this intersection or something like that. And the, the typical skeptic argument is that, oh, well, they received some, you know, kind of uh, subliminal indications that there was about to be an accident that happened. And that, that makes some sense, except that when you start reading about some of these, it's impossible, given the time frame, given the, the situation that they're in, in a lot of these cases, it's impossible for them to have received anything indicating that there was something about to happen. So I mean, I even remember Hartfeld talking about one time when he just had, he was compelled to walk over to his window and look out the door because he knew something was going to happen to his car. And as he's standing there staring at the street, you know, a car came down the, the road and smashed into his car. So these kind of things indicate some, you know, precognitive experience. And what would explain that? I mean, there's nothing really in science that explains that, but there's definitely something in the simulation idea that explains that. You know, if we're running a simulation, we could theoretically say, let's run a bunch of simulations on what could be happening right now based on the current state of the world and where the branches that they all go off on based on the free will of all the people involved. And wow, a whole bunch of these are indicating that something is probably going to happen. I better look out for that. So you see what I mean? There, there's a, an explanation for precognition in a simulation world that actually makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> Weird science indeed. And I thought this was interesting, but Dr. Kenneth Ring, professor of psychology at the University of Connecticut, wrote a book called Mindsight and investigated 31 blind people who had near-death experiences 
most reported visual experiences unlike anything they've ever had, yet blind people don't have visual dreams. And that's just a curious thing, but what does this say to you? Yeah, I mean, it, what it says to me is that there's a difference between a dream and a near-death experience. But I think that there's a, like a continuum of these kind of experiences. So a lot of our dreams probably have to do with the fact that, you know, as our kind of control center of our consciousness slips away when we go to sleep, we are able to kind of fantasize or you know play out various things you know, still in the reality that we're in. And so that is consistent with the idea that blind people don't tend to have these visual experiences when they dream. If they're congenitally blind, they never experience the idea of a visual experience. However, if they have a near-death experience, they have to be going somewhere else. They can't be just in their head and receive, you know, a visual experience. It has to be something else. So it to me, it, it says that there's something more significant about an NDE than just, you know, something that's coming from your brain. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely clues there. And that's exactly the kind of science I think we should be doing. And we know about insights from near-death experience, but what about shared death experiences? I don't even know that I'd ever heard this term before, but it covers a lot of strange things that people who are spending time with others at the moment of their death, apparently experienced sometimes. What's this about? Apparently it covers mist at death, beautiful music, a change in the geometry of the room, feeling a strong pull upwards on the body, sharing an out-of-body experience, seeing a mystical light, co-living the life review of a dying person, being greeted by the beings of light, and encountering heavenly realms and a boundary in that realm. That's the list you give in the book. But how do we fold these in to increase our understanding? Yeah, sure. I mean, one of the arguments against the idea of really you know, getting out of your body in a near-death experience is that, you know, what a lot of the material scientists will say is you're losing oxygen. It's oxygen deprivation that's causing these kind of hallucinatory things, you know, a closing down of your field of vision is what makes it look like you're going through a tunnel and seeing a light at the end of it. So that's the common argument. Unfortunately, when you start looking at different categories of experiences, it shoots holes in that argument. One way to shoot a hole in it is to say that when people aren't having a near-death experience, but losing, you know, having an oxygen deprivation to the brain, they don't see these things, these mystical realms, these deceased ancestors, these ideas of, you know, seeing a point where if they cross, they can't come back. You know, these are common experiences in a near-death experiences. But fighter pilots who hit six Gs and lose oxygen to the brain, they don't have those kind of experiences. Or, you know, people who have been in centrifuges or something like that where they've lost oxygen to the brain, they don't have near-death experiences. So that that argues against that idea. The other way to argue against the idea is people who have a similar experience and have never had any kind of oxygen deprivation because they're not dying. So you're sitting next to somebody who is passing away and you experience the same thing that they're experiencing. You experiencing aspects of this near death experience, you know, like the deathbed visions or, you know, the you know, seeing deceased individuals seeing a light having the feeling the deep feeling of you know being connected to something bigger people sometimes have these when they're in proximity of somebody who is passing away and there's no explanation for that in terms of oxygen deprivation so it rules that that scientific explanation out and that's what i think the, the significance of those studies are and another thing is you know children you know one one of the arguments has been that the reason that people see deceased individuals is because of wishful thinking. That's who they want to see. You want to see your grandparents who passed away or something like that. The children are also seeing deceased people that they didn't even know very well. And nobody ever seems to see in a near-death experience, nobody seems to see people who are currently alive. And that's a very strange anomaly. Absolutely, absolutely. 
And it also speaks to why some people who dabble in magic or some indigenous cultures, they will tell you to get right with your ancestors to pay attention to the generations that came before you. And maybe it's for this very reason. So you can recognize friendly faces on the other side. But right. it, it does go back to that thing we talked about, about the universe wanting to be understood. It's kind of like we have these near-death experiences and then we find some way to dismiss them and the universe says, okay, so you're not going to take that clue. Let me provide it to people who aren't undergoing the actual death experience and see how you deal with that. And it just fits. Yeah, I mean, and again, think of it as an analogy in a video game. If you're in a video game shooting monsters and doing whatever it is that you do over and over and over again, it gets pretty boring. And, you know, you'll move on to a different game with a different scenario. But if the creators of that game, or let's say it's a neural network that reinvents itself periodically, they keep on adding Easter eggs into it or new paths for exploration. Oh, here's an island that we didn't find before. Here's a kind of monster that we never saw before. It keeps things interesting and it keeps people learning, interacting, evolving their minds. And that seems to be what happens in our reality. It, it happens in science all the time. People back, I think it was Mickelson said in the late 1800s, we've discovered everything we need to discover in science. There's nothing more to, to discover other than getting a few more decimal points of accuracy in our measurements. And then boom, along comes relativity and quantum mechanics. And you know that just kind of blew the doors off of that idea. And over time, we always learn more and we have to realize how much we don't know we always think we know most everything and there's a little bit more to discover but that's not the case you know time immemorial there's been more that we don't understand than we do understand i'm sure you've seen that pie chart that shows this tiny little sliver of things that you know and then there's a, another slightly bigger sliver of things that you know you don't know and then there's this huge part of the pie chart that says things you don't know you don't know and <laughs> and that's i think that's the way our reality is and so yeah the system the universe the god all that there is whatever you want to call it to keep things evolving has to keep adding in these aspects to it that make us learn and discover more i agree i agree and i think it was either poppy bush or rumsfeld who gave that known unknown speech and a lot of people just scratched their head but this is exactly what that kind of referred to. I mean, obviously in a more political context, but uh, it is just interesting. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about manifestation too, because this is clearly a thing that is real and any model would have to fold it in. Of course, just the basic understanding that matter is derived from mind rather than the other way around and that matter is mostly empty space. Those things work to kind of demystify this manifestation thing. But how do you try to understand it and explain the mechanisms behind it? Tell me what you mean by manifestation. The idea that we can kind of create our reality, that you do these kind of mental cyclings like Bill Bengston's work, where you, uh, you know, take 10 images of things you want and you cycle them in your mind's eye all the time. And then you find further down the line that some of these things start to pop into your life. Okay. Yeah, no, I... I didn't know if you were talking about like manifestation of physical objects and things like that. <laughs> but <laughs> no, to me, if you accept the premise that our fundamental reality is soft, that we have free will and that we're working with a construct that is flexible, then that opens the possibility of our intent influencing that, doesn't it? I mean, if it was fixed and deterministic and, you know, the way some people still think is the idea of super determinism that Everything has already been predetermined and we're just going along for the ride. Our consciousness just appears to be, it appears that we have free will and we don't really, you know, we're just following the patterns of, you know, particles in our, in our brains and so forth. Unless you believe that, you know, you have to believe that there's, you know, something softer to the underlying construct and that therefore if it's soft and certainly software is, uh, information certainly is, you can modify it. I think Tom Campbell also had a good analogy here. You can't modify something that a whole lot of people are counting on. So, for example, let's say I want the stock market to go up tomorrow by 10 points or 100 points so that I can make a lot of money. But there's 
lots of other conscious intent out there that wants it to go down because they're selling short. So you can't force something by yourself to happen. However, if there's not, you know, one of the aspects that might make it more possible to manifest is the fact that you are the only one that's going to get value out of it. So things that are very personal to you, like becoming a better tennis player or something like that, there's no competing intent against that. Therefore, there's probably more likely that you can make that happen and you can, you know, kind of mold your, the underlying construct to, to make that work. So that's one thing. Another thing is how far away is it? If I want to be a better tennis player tomorrow, that's probably not going to happen. But if I, you know, want that over a longer period of time, it makes sense. Or let's say I have gotten a test that I have early stage of cancer or something. If I want that eradicated within seconds, I might not be able to do that. But through meditation, through manifestation, through visualization, it seems like I can have an influence on that over time. So given time and given the lack of competing intent, I think these things are possible, which is what explains the placebo effect, what explains power of positive thinking, visualization, the secret, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm curious, do you ever think about this in the context of your own journey? Because if I think back, you know, six years ago, I had just started a podcast, you had just written a book, and through those actions, we cultivated an audience, let's say. More people knew of your name after they read your book, and more people knew my name after they heard my show, and then maybe there's a bit of a snowball effect because when I read a book or see something that I like in media, I want it to do well. I want it to improve. And it's almost as like if you can gather some type of audience and they like what you do and you can attract more consciousnesses to hoping that your story progresses and you have successes. I mean, maybe that is kind of how it works in the trajectory of a person's career or whatever could be affected by just that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're all, you know, 8 billion of us or however many there are on the planet right now. And again, assuming that we all have free will, <laughs> there could be some zombies walking around out there. I don't know if we want to go that far, but assuming that we all have free will and individuated consciousness, we've got this, you know, amazingly complex set of intents and desires and, and things that all work together. And the system has to be incredibly complex to make sense of it all. It can kind of wash it all out and say nobody gets anything that they want, or it could be sort of uh, random and say everybody gets a, a couple of things that they want every once in a while, but it's much more nuanced and much more complex than that. So when people have a strong will to do something and believe in it, you know, I think that's the, that's the force that makes it manifest, that makes it happen. You know, you believed in your podcast, you got a little bit of feedback, it kept you believing, you know, and it grew from there and, and now it's influencing other people. And so it's, it's, it's taken off. My first book was a, a surprise to me that it did as well as it did and got as many sort of adherence and, and people talking about things. You know, between that and Tom Campbell's book and you know, some things that uh, Brian, I uh, can't remember the last name from New Zealand, had written and Nick Brostrom, you know, there, there are only a few of us 10 years ago that were writing about this kind of stuff. Now you see articles in Newsweek and, you know, Science Today and, you know, basically every periodical about, you know, the possibility of simulation. And a lot of universities are having digital philosophy departments now, and it's just totally taken off. Was it because of us, or was it because of, you know, the Wachowski Brothers movie, or was it because of the Philip K. Dick's ideas 30 years ago, or what? It's really hard to say, and I don't think anybody should ever take credit for any of it, but, you know, it's this complex confluence of things that has really changed the way we look at things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I definitely don't mean to bore people with a conversation about how well we're doing, but... I just think if we're trying to find something that, you know, people can use in their own lives, it's kind of a jailbreak in a sense that maybe we walked into as, say, independent media figures broadly, 
because compare that journey to the journey of someone in middle management at Verizon. How many people are concentrating on your success versus how many people in that microcosm actually don't want your success? They want your job. They want that promotion over you. Think about the resistance to climbing a corporate ladder as opposed to creating something of your own that other people are enjoying and no one can take my place. No one can write the book for you. So that's kind of moot. But people, if they enjoy what you're doing and you're, I guess, living your true will to use a cliche phrase, maybe that amplifies everything because it definitely, you can see the dichotomy of the corporate world and how all these mechanisms would be completely out of whack. Yeah. And interesting you bring that up. My role in the corporate world is to fight against those kinds of ideas, fight against the you know, competition for resources, you know, teaching managers how to empower, you know, the software developers, you know, their teams. And it's, there is huge resistance to it. And there's resistance to these ideas because of fear. You know, if I'm a manager, like you said, at Verizon, and my value is in being smart and being experienced and telling people what to do, when you suddenly tell me that I can't tell people what to do, that I have to empower them, well, that just takes away part of what I used to do. Now, what do I do? Mm-hmm. And, you know, showing them a path that that brings out the best in people is is a challenging thing, uh, you know, especially when you've spent 30 years living in a scientific management paradigm of bureaucratic structures, you know, hierarchical management and things like that. I mean, I could go on and on about this, but, you know, we've lived that because you know, our society had the industrial revolution and there was a period of time where factories were the predominant you know, sources of employment for people. Well, factories were very mechanistic kinds of places. You know, this person did that. It passed on to this person, assembly lines. Everybody had a well-defined role. And it kind of made sense that maybe there were some management structures put in place to bring out the most efficiency of that organization. But that's not what companies are now. Companies are now trying to innovate and they're full of creative people and people who are thinking freely and trying to collaborate together. And you can't use the old ways of managing, you know, structures and factories on the new companies. And so that's a huge change that's happening in in our corporate world. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a noble goal you have for sure. I definitely find it harder to change a corrupt system than it is to just step out of it, but obviously we can't do that all the time. But I would just say to people, I guess if we understand these mechanisms, try to arrange your life so that they work for you rather than constantly battling upstream against the will and manifestation of people in a competitive environment. People have a lot of fear about taking a leap to doing something that is maybe a dream of theirs. Hopefully this kind of makes it a little bit of a softer landing for people. I mean, I don't know. I'm intrigued by it. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think Alan Watt had a, a speech once. There are some videos you can find on YouTube about, I, th- I think the title is something like, what would you do if money were no object? And it's really very inspiring. It's, you know, the idea that we build a wall around our, our possibilities because we think we have to pay our mortgage, we have to pay our bills, we have to live well, we have to do all these kinds of things. And we, you know, it's human nature to kind of spend what you have. So we always feel like we're extremely tight. I mean, everybody, most people do anyway. But he's saying, you know, if you follow your passion, you will find a way to make that your life. I mean, I've known people who, you know, had passion about art or music or, you know, animals or whatever it is. And If they follow that, they find a place and it actually ends up working out and they're very happy. So the thought that you have to be in the rat race and be disappointed with your job and your your career aspirations, not necessarily the case. You know, we feel like we have to compete for all of these resources that we have to compete for jobs. We have to compete for homes. We have to compete for spouses. If you, you know, take the things that we're talking about today and the things that are in my book at more than face value, you realize there's a bigger purpose and there's a bigger picture to it. And that there's no such thing as 
competition. It's not necessary. Your goal in your life is not to accumulate a lot of stuff and pass it down to other people because you pass on, they pass on, you live a different life next time. You know, it might be a good thing, I suppose, to do that, but it's, it, it takes away a little bit of the competitive edge, I think, when you realize that. It gets people out of their belief traps and it's, you know, gives them more of a peaceful, harmonious kind of point of view. Here, here, and cheers to that. So, right on. Well, Jim, it is such a treat to have you back. I suspect you'll get a bit more of a response than you did six years ago on dear old episode 80, but thanks for <laughs> taking the time then and now. Remind the fine folks about your website or any info about buying the book that you might want them to have. Oh, sure. Thanks for that opportunity, Greg. Really appreciate it. And again, thanks for asking me to come on the show. You know, I love being on your show and, you know, I, I love your topics, your audience, your vibe, the whole thing. I think it's great. Thanks. As far as the, the book, I have a website. The website is theuniversesolved.com. It's a little bit out of date, but it has a link to my blog on there. There's a hundred or so blogs uh, posted about various things. There's a link to the book. So there are two books, uh, The Universe Solved which was the original uh, about 10 years ago in digital consciousness. If you're going to pick one book, I'd pick the more recent one, digital consciousness, because it you know, covers a lot of what the universe solve covers and does it in a more scientific and with some visual models that I think are, are pretty useful. And it goes beyond a little bit, but the first one, you know, has some provocative ideas that I didn't repeat as well. So they're both, they're both okay. And you can get those on Amazon. You can order them from any bookstore. Most bookstores don't carry them on the shelves, but it can certainly be ordered from the stores. And there are Kindle versions of both, and uh, Universal was converted into German, so that's available in the German market as well. Awesome. Well, I do appreciate what you do. Mind-blowing stuff. Digital Consciousness is such a great book. As we said, the illusion can be persistent, so... When it is, you pull this book out and there's plenty of studies and data to bring you back to the weird side. So definitely check it out. And I'm glad you cracked the case, man. Keep doing what you do and take care out there. Thanks very much, Greg. The power of Christ compels you, people. There it is. The long-awaited return of Jim Elvidge. I am definitely happy we had him back. I like the way he looks at reality. He's not afraid to go after the weird stuff and find a way to work it into the model. And he's pretty comfortable with even the weirdest of questions from me, even if they really aren't in his arena of study specifically. As I kind of mentioned, his book does hit on a lot of that strange consciousness science and data that almost defies logic when you see some of the results. But people are always sort of saying that you have to believe for this stuff to work. And it's reading about the breakdowns of those studies that actually gets me over that belief hump, I think. I'm sure a lot of you guys feel the same way. At least when you read some of that stuff, then maybe you feel like you wouldn't be wasting your time if you were to put conscious attention into certain things or try a couple of these practices. Bada bing, bada boom. Next thing you know, you're changing the world. But not only was I not really expecting that to be in Jim's book, he also hits on research I hadn't even read about before, and it was awesome to be able to fold a lot of that into this conversation. We've heard phrases like, the Earth is a cosmic school before, so the learning lab is a pretty easy concept to grasp, but it's the way he conceptualizes consciousness interacting with the learning lab that really ties it all together, though. So I would expect THC fans to like a show like this every once in a while, a guest whose focus is on trying to map and model our reality using all the available information, building a picture that does actually include a lot of the things that have been left out of the model they construct for the masses. Because we've seen the declassified CIA documents that prove their construct of reality looks a lot more like Jim's than Ray Kurzweil's, and it has for decades. But they're more than happy to prop up these false idols and let you think that these are the brightest minds of our time, that these guys have all the answers. 
Meanwhile, we see occult aspects of the Empire and massive amounts of symbol usage and perception management. So it seems like their concept is a bit different too. And we really are playing catch up when it comes to knowing who we are or where we are or why we are. These are the biggest secrets of the system, right? I care way more about that stuff than I do who the president was mean to this week. The whole thing's a goddamn mystery, although I do think we get closer and have a clearer picture as we whittle down our own models, but it's still our best guess and we are kind of on our own because nowhere in mainstream culture are we having this conversation. It's freaking sad. We can debate who knows what, but it's no secret that the masses are steered away from ever even really considering the big picture. So we owe it to ourselves to explore as much of it as we can without being initiated into secret orders or having the lock code to the Vatican archives and being able to crack open privileged information. So to me, what Jim does, which really just seems to be a pure passion, is actually also a real service to humanity. And as he said, he's not claiming all these ideas are original or completely new or unique, but he's pulling together a lot of the -the off-the-radar clues, a lot of indigenous knowledge or very long-standing Eastern spirituality traditions, a lot of modern science as well, and saying, with the info we have right now, this is what it looks like. And I appreciate that. If I had to guess, one of the first things you learn about when you see a secret society degree that matters is this very kind of stuff. Forget what you've been told. Here's the real deal with this life thing. And I think the more you understand a model like Jim's, it's not hard to walk it backwards and see why it would be kept behind the curtain and how the control structure achieves its goals in a lot of ways. But it seems that since that last interview, he's had several more years to dig and flesh out the big ideas, and I was definitely captivated by the book and the conversation. I actually have a very big guest coming up that also is known for his understanding of reality. We've talked about his work with a guest before, but I never thought we'd be able to get the man himself. But it fell right into my lap, thanks to that previous guest, and we'll Keep referring to him as Hollow Fractal Joe, just to give you a little clue there for the people who are pretty familiar with the THC archive, but I am really looking forward to that one as well. Of course, with this show and every show I do, the first hour is free, it's out there, no ads, no bullshit, just for you to enjoy, and hopefully, if you like what I do, you come over to the Higher Side Chats Plus, and you sign up for the full two-hour shebang, an extra hour with every guest. And in this episode with Jim, some of the things we talked about were the resisting and restricting of new models we see in the scientific community, how many standard theories actually fail to meet the criteria set up for scientific acceptance, what memories really are, where they're stored, Jim's thoughts on the Mandela Effect phenomenon and how he explains it, pyramids and the potential to enhance consciousness effects, and the age-old question of if royal families or secret societies have ever jailbroken the learning lab. Is it even possible? Of course, for better or worse, that's where my mind goes. But I really had a great time. In higher side news, the website consolidation is still happening on August 5th. Watch your bookmarks and RSS feeds for any hiccups or changes. But I'm sure it will be fine. We'll be well past the rough space weather at that point. And I guess it's just a waiting game till then. Of course, I got one more show coming out in the next 48 hours, and then we can call it a wrap on July. But I'll see you then. Big thanks again to Jim for bringing the heat. I've done my part. Your move, consciousness deceivers, reality concealers, and keepers of the secrets behind the big curtain. Your fucking... Everybody 
always looking for something Some of them want to use you Some of them want to get used by you Some of them want to abuse you Some of them want to be us